like to talk about this recent project I just completed with the Gallery 221A and Pollyanna Library. It's on a site called Semi Public, and it is uh, an empty lot situated between two other buildings that are active. One is a residential space, and one's a business space. And then it's this empty lot, ground level and street level. And uh, I was asked to create uh, a wilded forest space. So through working with students they hired and with a, an architecture student that does landscape architecture, we created beautiful plans to, uh, to build basically a little forest between the two buildings. And all the mounds, uh, instead of just putting just solid earth, we put mounds and they're all in Coast Salish form line shapes, so like half moons and circles and so two big eyes essentially that are sitting a little not sitting like this but kind of sitting like this and then a flowing uh, walkway between and each of the mounds has all indigenous plants so there's food plants medicine plants and utilitarian plants so things that can be used for art supplies or tools or medicine that could be made for healing or uh, food mostly berries, a lot of berries on the site. And especially because it's a neighborhood where so many diverse cultures go that I knew that putting in plants with berries that are really common that people know, then it'll be easy for people to kind of come through and say, oh, hey, what's this? Like, you know, oh, I know this. And, and be able to bring their families in. And so for the circular parts of the eyes, one we created kind of a half moon uh, bench with a cob oven. So it's cob and cob is mud and clay and sand and earth and rocks and straw and it's all kind of pushed together to create a form and then when it dries, it dries very solid and hard and becomes a really great bench. Uh, or, and in this case, we have a bench with an oven. And I was thinking about what do people miss in the city? What do they not have? They don't have an opportunity to have outside fires, right? And I figured that this would be a beautiful way to bring people in. They could have a little fire, bake a pizza or a pie or, you know, even cookies, whatever, but just bake small things that would fit in the oven and, and just have that time sitting outside and interacting and eating together and so all those things excited me a lot to think you know that's a gift to the community so if I can create something that um, that I can work on with the community so the entire project I worked with native youth to build the mounds and then we did a work party with the whole community to build the uh, to build the cob oven and bench and we worked with a really cool collective of women called the Mud Girls, and they come in and they, they yeah, I'll make sure I give you links to everything, but they are a really cool group of uh, female identifying people that like to do things collectively and they like to make homes from the earth, basically. So they build a lot of houses, but they do benches and stoves as well, ovens, so. It's really nice uh, to be able to work with people that that love working with whole communities. And a project like that, you, you need the whole community to come in and tromp the mud and help to carry heavy things and and to observe and to to have conversations around it. So it's, it was very exciting. And then the other circular part of the garden was a, was a spiral garden. I was really excited about building it because I did a permaculture course a year and a half ago and I was like, oh, I really want to build this. And then I, then I injured myself and I couldn't do things on the site. So, uh, so I actually took one of the youth I work with and I pulled her aside and I asked if she could become the lead on the rest of the project. And she was like, yes, <laughs> she totally owned it. And when I came for the cob oven workshop, she had built the spiral garden on her own and with big rocks and lots of earth. And I was like, wow, like you are so dedicated to this work. So it, it excited me that even though I kind of had a literally a fall and, uh, and I got held back, but 
having that element of working with a team and knowing who you can rely on and I just think it means a lot. I know if I was a 20-something youth that uh, was working with an artist and they pulled me aside and said that I had what it took to, to help finish the project, I would really want to own that. So it made me feel good to give that kind of energy over, pass over that knowledge. And I did, you know, I said, I'll, I'm here to guide you, but I, I can't get up and do things and I can't get over to the, up that side of the garden really fast. So I, those are the things I need for you to help me with. And she really owned it and she really took it seriously. And, uh, you know, she's continued to go back and forth even uh, since we did the big work parties because there's still little chunks of work that have to be done. And she just went and and took care of it and checks in with me regularly. And I felt like, okay, I'm still part of this because I'm, I'm actually going to a level I love to work at, which is training the next generation. And I think with the work we do, we, we need to have an element that is all about giving the next generation tools to, to help them, right? And on that note, the, project so that project I talked about is um, is just completing itself and we'll have a big launch next month but as I phase off from that project I go into a bigger project with the city of Vancouver and it's a public art commission but what's really interesting about it is we're not building a sculpture we're not building a structure at all we are decomposing things for the next year <laughs> So mushrooms and um, we're making seed bombs so that plants will grow and then decompose and uh, getting mulch, so collecting leaf matter and such in the fall that will spread over a site and let it decompose. And all of these elements are about taking, um, going from dirt to earth. So dirt is a colonized state. It's had everything taken out of it and stripped to nothing. And earth is rich with everything that you could imagine. It's, it's anything can grow in it. Nothing is gonna grow in dirt, but everything will grow in earth. And so we're just uh, taking those elements and experimenting for the next year on how things decompose and how it changes the actual ground around it, whether it's dirt or earth and how that shifts from you know, this simple state to a more complex state. And, and on top of all that, one of the goals of our project is to create a, a toolkit for urban indigenous youth to learn ethnobotany and herbalism and how to seek, um, how to find teachers on their own. Uh, because often indigenous youth in the urban communities don't have elders, they don't have knowledge keepers, they don't always know where they're from. So there are all these reasons that they're so disconnected and yet they have a self-determined edge. They, you know, there are things about them that you wouldn't know they were kept from their culture because they have the tools of their ancestors, but they don't always have the teachings, right? So we thought we would create a, a document that easily could be given to youth to help them, guide them through the steps of becoming an ethnobotanist or an herbalist. Yeah, so I, I think with uh, the consideration of taking our work that we're researching and giving part of it uh, a focus of developing this toolkit for young people is one of the big driving forces for me for this project is that we're creating something that's going to be so useful so we're not just decomposing things for a year and having fun which is really cool <laughs> but um, through that work we're also looking at how it decolonizes a space in the city and even growing certain plants in different areas that haven't been there for a long time uh, it's the inspiration of what this garden is when we when we were given this site, the uh, brambles were so high that they were about 20 feet high in here. And we hadn't seen this ground in a couple of decades. And uh, one of the things 
it's a very flat area where we are in this community because this is the original riverbed. So before contact, the, the Capilano River flowed right here where we're sitting. So we find a lot of rocks, very sandy here. And then things uh, changed over time and for about 25 years, this site, which... So yeah, this garden is an amazing place because when we first decided to uh, start a garden, we didn't know where we would do that. And one of the, the hereditary chiefs came to my mother's home and told her about this site, that it was slated to be a park. And so at one time, this was just gonna be a park for kids to play in and people to hang out in. And that was why it, it's such a big space in the middle of the community but nobody ever acted on it. And so when we put a word out that we wanted a garden, this uh, hereditary chief came to my mom's door and said, hey, you can have this site. And we we're like, okay. And we went up and we we're like, oh. And it was all blackberry brambles. And it was like there were rodents coming in and out. And we were a little bit like, oh, okay. Looks really scary, but let's do it. It's all blackberry brambles. So we took everything down and leveled everything out and um, it was interesting because the day that we leveled everything out uh, we had just gotten everything done and we looked up and there were eagles above us there were 16 eagles and all the people working stopped working and like there was one guy in a little uh, I don't know some kind of machinery and he stopped and got out and he started counting the eagles and he's like 16 and we all counted 16 and we're like that is amazing because there were 16 original families from this nation and we were like, what? So we felt really blessed, you know, that all these eagles and they stayed. And so I started drumming, I drum a song to sing and thank them. And, and so four of them stayed for quite a while and then they all spread in different directions. And we were like, wow, oh, that was really magical. Like ancestors are watching us. So we felt really good that we're on the right track. And, and then we, I, asked the elders to help me design the beds but they were shy so they said you do it so I designed them to look like giant flower heads like sunflowers with pointy petals but I also wanted the petals to look like the tips of the paddles and then the funny thing was that when we <laughs> we laid them out and had them stacked up people came out and said hey I thought you were building a garden and we're like yeah we are and they're like yeah they look like coffins and we're like oh <laughs> we didn't mean for them to look like coffins it's just the way they were shaped, right? But once they were laid down and in patterns, people saw it and uh, they were like, oh yeah, okay, got it. It's big sunflowers, okay? <laughs> so it was kind of hilarious, but it made people come out and talk to us and we thought that was good. And, and it was mostly the elders. The elders said they really wanted this community garden because they felt concerned about the next generation and especially the youngest generation they felt like the kids thought everything came in a box and that everything was packaged and they didn't know what things look like in the natural world. And they're like, we need kids in our community to know what a flower is and what a bug is and all these things. They need to know what nature is and they're removed from nature here in the city. So, so we really set out to put indigenous plants in this garden. And so I'm sitting in front of this beautiful forest that when we planted it, it was all up to my knee. <laughs> so it grew in 10 years into a luscious, tiny forest filled with food and medicine and utilitarian plants. And it has also been a sanctuary for migratory birds, regional birds, uh, there are probably at least six to seven uh, types of wild bees that live in this garden that actually hive here and live here. So mason bees, several types of bumbles. There's at least three types of bumblebees and that alone makes me happy because they're on the verge of extinction. So we are really determined to keep them alive. And we do have honeybees. We have some honeybees here and produce honey for the community. and. And, uh, and to keep this garden really well pollinated. And, <laughs> you know, we figured if we bring our bees in, they help us and they help everybody. And uh, when we first started learning about bees, we realized that bees actually make fruit plumper and they make it more delicious. Hi guys. And, and there's a couple of young guys that come and help out in the garden all the time. And, 
and uh, <laughs> they're gonna come in and see your your setup but you know this garden for us is all about the children and making a safe place for them to be and for them to enjoy what uh, nature has to offer and to learn about indigenous foods and medicines and and to meet neighbors right hey hey guys I have waited so long do you want to come in here sure. be on TV for a minute we're not really on TV we're on a movie come on over here I need you guys to stand on either side of me just do this come on come over here or put your put lean on me like this no how about this? Yeah, you can do that. Figures. You have the same height. Yeah, you have to be a little bit lower than me. You have to get down and then look in. We'll be like, we're the bad gardeners. Look at Mark. That's my friend Mark. Hey. Hi. And say your names. Hi, my name is Zach. Hi, my name is Jaden. Yeah, these are the gardeners of all gardeners, these guys. Without them, plants die here, right? <laughs> oh, you have one of the famous golf balls. Can I see it for a sec? I was just telling Mark that there used to be a golf driving range. We now find golf balls at random times when we're gardening. They just pop up. People go, what's this doing here? I don't know, it just appeared. Oops. <laughs> we had Zach from too yesterday. So what are you guys going to do? Are you going to do some watering? Uh, yeah. Okay. We watered. Did you bring any snacks? All, uh, no, but I could get you some. Um, you know, all the seedlings that are in there need watering. I watered those yesterday. Oh, thank you. Well, go ahead and water the ones in the, in the greenhouse. And then come back and check in. Can you see the medicine wheel now? <laughs> Yeah, so it's, for me, I'm really happy that I have had a chance to really engage with young people. When, uh, when a lot of, there was some vandalism going on here for a few years, and some of it was from the kids, but some of it was from adults, and I got really concerned that young people didn't understand the importance of the garden and what it means, because we all need to garden in some way to stay alive, right? So really just started focusing my efforts on teaching young people what everything is and uh, so we bought bee suits for kids so they can go right up and look and know what we're doing and we also just started uh, explaining all the systems like we grow seeds and seedling trays and then we plant them in places they need to be and talk about how there's companion gardening so plants that help each other and plants that don't like each other so kids all thought that was funny because they're like, oh, there's sometimes kids I don't like, but then there's kids I like. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's kind of like that. <laughs> so helping them understand the relationship with uh, the natural world and what gardening can really do for them, right? And so now I'm finding out from their grandparents, like the two young guys that were here, their grandparents come to me and they're really grateful for what the kids are learning here. and. When they take off, they ask, where are you going? The garden, okay, you're fine. So this has become a safe place for the kids. And I think that if we focus all of our energy on the children feeling safe, learning about their traditional plants and learning how to grow food and just how long it takes to grow food. Like some of them couldn't believe it takes a year to grow garlic and it takes a year Oh, it takes 10 months to grow corn and so all these things that they thought they could just get now they know why they have to wait for certain seasons to eat things and so we're teaching the seasons we're teaching about you know life and and death we <laughs> things do die in the garden and, <laughs> and the plants die or you know little critters the bees we got bees die so we talk about everything cycle of life talk about nature and we talk about how important it is that we all uh, do our part to keep everything balanced here. Yeah. So this one here is wild ginger and you can see the beautiful heart-shaped leaves. It's a rhizome-based plant so it actually will 
pull it up a little bit. So this one is for digestion, and but it's interesting to me that when I lay it out, it kind of looks like kidneys. <laughs> and we use every part of it. It has uh, a smell like ginger, and it tastes like ginger that you would find in the tropics, but it is the ginger that grows in these mountains. and and uh, forests, and mostly up high in the mountains, not ever this low, but uh, it's taken me years and I finally got it to start growing here at this level. Yeah. Yeah, so I thought it'd be nice to show you this panel and to see uh, one of the ways that we're trying to teach people in our community by just having something accessible uh, for everybody to be around. So we thought about this didactic panel on indigenous plants and uh, we set forth to put plants in here that match the, the images we chose so that people coming in here can teach themselves about indigenous plants. So you can see I have the wild ginger in my hand, also known as Asarum canadense and also as Chet Tanai, Chet Tanai. And so we use all parts of the plant and uh, with this panel we use real photos so that people aren't just looking at images and drawings, they're actually seeing what plants look like. And so Kinnik Kinnik, Arctostophilus uber ursi, and Red Huckleberry, Squalam, Squalam, and uh, having the different languages on there helps whoever comes into contact with this have an understanding of, of the names, the different names that each plant has and it's important for us to share our language in our community but we also want people to understand that if they're becoming more serious about learning about plants to know the Latin names and the common English names becomes very important because not all textbooks are going to be written in the Skomish Snechum. They will be written in English and Latin and many other languages. So it gives us, with the Latin name, it gives us a, an anchor for people to understand uh, what our names are for them and what they're commonly known as in the world and that there have been many people that have researched these plants for centuries. So we have a lot of knowledge we can gain from, from many people and to have it be right here in our community it gives people kind of it's a little library right here <laughs> i try to tell people go to the library which is really the indigenous forest at our garden because it is sitting here a wealth of knowledge inspiration and it's a beginning guide for those that that haven't learned anything about traditional medicines we like that so we have lady fern ethereum Felix Femina, also known as Pataquam, and Pataquam are actually a common name for many types of ferns, but Pataquam is going to be the lady fern today, but I've also seen it called uh, Pataquam with other ferns. It sometimes becomes a common name. And yeah, we eat the fiddleheads, but we don't eat it when it gets bigger because it, become, it changes its properties and becomes inedible. Then we have Salal or Galtheria Shalon, and we say Takahe. And Takahe is a very important food to our people. The berries are very rich in antioxidants and they, they're very juicy. So one of the things our people did for centuries was make uh, what we call berry cakes by squishing all of our wild berries together and drying them, almost like a granola bar style and then letting that dry in the sun. And what we would do is create a really good uh, dry food for us in the winter. And salal becomes one of the very important ones because it's very rich in antioxidants and other nutrients. And then fireweed, epilobium angustifolium uh, is the Latin name. And then we say hocht, hocht. And hawk is what we use 
We uh, we use fireweed, the hacht, for creating a soft texture in the wool that we weave. So wool is a bit abrasive until we add softer fibers, and this is a very important fiber, the fireweed. So it's one of our favorites, and my daughter is obsessed with it right now, and she gathers it every year now. Hopefully one day we'll have enough to make a beautiful blanket. <laughs> Then we have the wild rose, also known as Rosa Pisacarpa, and we say Kalke. Kalke is uh, the name of the wild rose, but we don't just use the rose, we use the fruit of the rose. When it has been pollinated, it turns into a berry, and that berry is uh, mostly known as a rose hip, not as a roseberry. <laughs> But uh, the rose hips are high in vitamin C, and we gather them, we freeze them, we scoop out the seeds and get rid of them, we wash them and dry them again, and then we make a tea from that. And it is high in vitamin C, and it helps us stay healthy. Then we have red elderberry, Sambucus racemosas, and it's I'm still learning the language, so I do it very slowly. And we have to cook the berries, otherwise they are toxic. So there are two types of elderberries. We have a red elderberry, but we also have a black elderberry. And the black elderberries you can eat right off the tree, but the red elderberries have to be cooked before they can be eaten. And both of them have flowers that can be used uh, to make tea for your respiratory system. And then the soap berry, which is Shepardia canadensis, we also say squawsome, squawsome. And it is our ice cream. So we, why it's ice cream is that when you pick the berries, they start to get frothy, almost like a soap. And when you whip them, they become, uh, they look like ice cream, and uh, but foamy ice cream. <laughs> it's really delicious. And uh, some people add other berries to embellish the flavor a bit because they're quite bitter and the taste isn't for everybody. And a lot of people say it tastes like soap, but I don't think it tastes like soap. It just tastes like a really bitter berry. <laughs> it's really good medicine for your, your blood. Then we have sword fern, polystichum munitum, also known as scholetqua. And we use the, the roots uh, as a tea to rinse for our hair to make it stronger. So it's a way to, to feed our hair. And so I guess that's our shampoo <laughs> in a sense, but yeah, it helps to thicken our hair, and with, a, with thick hair, you have a strong heart. And then Ocean Spray, which is actually one of my favorite plants in here because it's very pretty with lots of flowers. Holodiscus discolor, and it's very similar to the rose in the name. The wild rose name is Kalke, and Ocean Spray is Ka'a. So, written it looks similar but it's a little bit different when you say it it's like alt a so we have to use those accents to highlight those and the ocean spray also known as ironwood um, we use the sticks like they grow really tall and strong and we use those sticks to barbecue our salmon with and they withhold the heat well these are our bees that we've had um, We've been beekeeping now for about seven or eight years, and I think the bees that we've installed this year we've had for two months now. And so it's it's a come and go thing. Like we have some good years and we have some not so good years. Uh, the longest we've kept one hive was three years out of the six years, so that's pretty good. But we do have to come up with a better system so they don't get uh, drenched out in the winter time. 
The real concern is the moisture content here because we're on the Pacific Northwest coast and it's almost easier to hold bees, uh, have the same bees for several years in Alberta than it is in BC because we're so wet here. We don't freeze. When things freeze, everybody, you know, quiets down. But when it's rain, it gets inside the hives and, and then they all huddle together and then they die. So we have to find a better way to keep them dry in the winter and protect them. But without the bees, we're lost. So our garden really sustains honeybees and mason bees and bumblebees and carpenter bees and hornets and wasps and all kinds of incredible pollinators and of course hummingbirds. So we like things with, that are small that buzz and hum and pollinate things and care for the, the garden and the community. And you know in the beginning people were not excited when we brought bees here but then they started to see their fruit plumped up and they actually started to see that the bees didn't bug them at all and they discovered that they really liked being around the bees and so now people come and check them out and they come and talk to us about it and they have been learning how to accept them and it's been a much better relationship for our community garden and the community.